All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Resource Insider Podcast. And today I'm talking to someone I have been waiting for a couple of weeks to talk to. Uh, we've had this scheduled for just a little while now, and we're going to get into gold exploration in Nevada and a lot of other things. And her name is Cherie Ledin, and she is the CEO of Gold Bull Resources. And she's joining us today from just outside of Reno, Nevada. So, Cherie, how are you? Yeah, sorry. Cherie, how are you? I'm losing my, uh, my tongue already. I'm doing good. It's a beautiful day here in Nevada. So, we're going to get into a lot of things in our discussion today. But I think uh, for the best place to start is to tell everyone what Gold Bull Resources is, what you guys are doing and who you are and sort of the, you know, the 30,000 foot overview of your background. Can we get into that? Yeah, for sure. So I'm, I'm originally from Perth, Western Australia. I've resided in the US for uh, the past five years. Uh, I've got a, a degree in geology from Curtin University. So I'm a geologist by background and uh, work-wise, we've recently formed a new company, Gold Bull Resources. Uh, and, um, Gold Bull is very much focused on gold assets in Nevada. To a lesser extent, we'll look at, at Western Utah. Uh, my career and a snapshot uh, for the you know, for 20 years experience, the first decade was very much a boots on ground geologist. And for the past decade, I've been more in corporate CEO type roles. So you're an Aussie geologist. You know, there's lots of gold in Western Australia. How do you end up uh, working in Nevada? So I first uh, came to Nevada 10 years ago. I, uh, I vended some assets, some gold assets to an ASX listed company called Cassini. And it was during that project generative um, period that I was really blown away by the opportunity in this state. Uh, I came to learn that it, it's the richest gold endowed state on the planet. So there's more gold per square kilometre here than anywhere else in the world. And then um, I, I dug a little deeper and I discovered that the Americans have done an extre extremely good job of exploring for the outcropping geology, the deposits that are, are sticking out of the ground. But most of the state is actually covered by um, pediment or, or sand cover. And there's been really limited drilling underneath that cover. So for me, there was an immediate opportunity um, to be looking under the cover. In, in Western Australia, where I come from, we don't really have a choice. It's essentially all undercover. Mm -hmm. So exploring undercover isn't something new um, to Aussie Geos, and it's something that uh, we feel we can really create immense value out of in this state using our, our technology and our experience from home. Yeah, so this is something we've talked about on the podcast before. You know, a few weeks ago, we had a friend of mine on uh, named Francis McDonald. He's the VPX from a company called Canora Land Resources. And they recently made a discovery in the Abitibi in Quebec, uh, Undercover, uh, one of the first drill programs that they've launched. And you know, we kind of got into that, and he said something very similar to you, that the Australians have a lot of experience exploring undercover versus just um, outcropping deposits, whilst Canadians and, and Americans have, you know, I think given the nature of the geology in this part of the world had a lot of low hanging fruit to pick, mm -hmm. I guess, and are only starting to, to catch up to that. And I think, you know, um, it's worth us getting into this, the difference between those two things and the methodology. And, and then maybe we'll talk about how this might apply to your strategy at Gold Bull Resources. So for people at home who have no idea what we're talking about right now versus an outcrop and discovery or exploration versus undercover, what does that actually mean? All right, so set, let, let's use Nevada as an example. So 40%, about 40% of the state has rocks sticking out of the ground. So you can actually see a rock or an outcrop uh, and a, a geologist can go to that, that outcrop, take a sample. And we've got a very idea of whether there's gonna be gold underneath that rock. It gets a little more complicated when you have sand cover um, or pediment cover, in which case there's there's rock underneath the sand cover, you just can't see the rock. And in, sometimes that cover can be up to 100 metres or more uh, thick. And um, that cover presents a, a, a number of challenges that you don't ordinarily get if you've got a rock sticking out of the ground. Uh, because in order to 
work out whether there's any gold in that, you can't sample what's on top because what's on top could have come from anywhere. So geochemistry becomes less um, useful. And then we rely more on other techniques such as geophysics and geophysics um, essentially is like an x-ray of the earth to work out uh, where the structures are, what, what kind of rocks are there. We can, we can do a number of geophysical techniques such as magnetics, which tells us the magnetic properties of the rocks, which then allows us to guess what rocks are under there. Uh, we can do IP, which tells us if there's sulfides uh, and which are li likely related to gold mineralization. Um, and there's a, there's a whole bunch of science that, that's available and um, that we do rely on. And then there's also low cost drilling techniques um, that we can consider to penetrate through that cover to work out what rock is underneath. So um, it, it, it is um, a little higher risk, but also um, higher reward because if, if there was a massive discovery sticking out of the ground, it would have already been found. So we firmly mm -hmm. believe that big discoveries are gonna be those undercover deposits. Um, so we think it's worth the, the, the additional cost involved with going to that extra effort. So, so I have a couple questions around this. You know, obviously, oh, I say obviously, but I assume, you know, pretty much every rock that's been sticking out of the ground in places like Nevada has been kicked and turned over by some geologist at some time over the last several hundred years that they've been exploring and mining gold there. So people are, I mean, people are going to have to go undercover, I assume at this point, if they're going to continue to make discoveries in well-known gold jurisdictions. Yeah, it's, it's going to become more and more common that we'll be forced to go undercover. So I guess my question is, do investors in exploration projects, do mining companies, et cetera, do we just need to accept that the cost of discovery is going to go up now, uh, that more drilling has to be done, that more uh, you know, geophysical techniques and other things that you discussed will have to be employed than they're previously used to? Or I don't know, have in Australia, have they, have they managed to find ways to minimize expenses while still exploring undercover? I think a bit of both. Often geophysics is a really effective tool which minimizes um, the amount of drilling that you would ordinarily do if you weren't engaged in geophysics. So you could have um, outcropping geology and decide to drill that on a, on a grid, say 100 meter by 100 meter space grid to try and work out where the mineralization is. Or you could do geophysics, which will essentially assist in delineating where that ore body is rather than just do drilling from the surface. So. Um, th there will be some pros and there's some cons. Um, it's certainly nice to have that geochemical aspect, which you often do lack when there is cover. Um, and I, I, I do believe it will be a bit of a balancing act. There's, there's also some new sciences with te technologies and uh, geochemical techniques, which, which claim to be able to see undercover and um, various techniques. But for us, geophysics is going to be our main tool, geophysics combined with, yeah. uh, with cheap drilling. Uh, we don't need to do diamond drilling for a, an early stage target, for example, undercover, um, we'll, we'll be looking at reverse circulation and air core and much cheaper methods until we get to the mineralization. Would you say that um, geophysics have been, I guess, underemployed in places like Nevada in the past compared to compared to say Australia? Absolutely. I, you know, I know a lot of projects that have never received geophysics, so. Uh, for, for me, coming from um, my Aussie background, even um, my, my time spent working in Canada, they use it a lot less uh, in the USA. Uh, and I, I do think there's a massive opportunity for geophysics. Uh, well, the, the geophysical surveys that I've been involved with in recent years in Nevada have been extremely successful. Uh, in particular, uh, 3D IP has it's really been successful in lighting up um, sulfides and mineralization, the systems that uh, I've worked on. So I, I do think it's been underutilized. Uh, I think it's, they're starting to use it a little bit more. Also, um, the, you know, in generalizing, um, ge generally speaking, there's been a real focus on Carlin style deposits and very model driven focus. Whereas we're thinking a little more outside the box. Uh, we're, we're very much interested in epithermal gold deposits. We think they've been underexplored compared to their, their Carlin cousins in this state. Mm. And you know, for us, we're, we're agnostic with respect to the style of mineralization. We're looking for economic and profitable deposits. And I think uh, you'll see a lot of our focus on the epithermal style. So can you give us the 
geology for idiots overview of what a Carlin style deposit is in Nevada versus uh, an epithermal style deposit? Sure, I, I guess um, I guess a lot of the focus has been on Carlin style deposits because they form some of the, the largest, most profitable um, deposits on the planet and they, they, they tend to be um, located in this wonderfully fertile state. They're, they're massive deposits, they're company making assets and uh, at, at, they're highly desirable and the majors are all chasing these Carlin deposits. They, they, they have a very long mine life, um, low operating costs. Um, epithermal deposits, um, on the other hand, their, their genesis um, is a little different. They tend to, to be um, different sizes, different grades. There's a lot more variability. Uh, and um, the epithermal deposits that we're looking at, we're looking at major systems that are, are, are volcanic are related and are originated. And uh, we, we do believe there's multi-million ounce potential. There's a number of uh, epithermal deposits that, that are known to be multi-million ounces. Uh, I'm involved with another one called Hog Ranch, owned by Rex Minerals. And it's another classic example of millions of ounces of gold um, just sitting there, literally at the surface, that has been neglected because it isn't um, on the Carlin train and it is an epithermal style deposit. So that was actually going to be my next question. You know, are there examples of these in Nevada and, and have you worked in them before? So you've worked in Hog Ranch. Are there any, are there any you know, producing epithermal gold mines in Nevada? Mm -hmm. we, we, we have Round Mountain, which is a, a significant um, deposit, yes. um, you know, extremely profitable operation. Uh, Sandman that we've recently acquired uh, is an epidermal target. And uh, there we're, we're certainly looking at um, a combination of the, the surface oxide deposit and also the feeder zones. The feeder zones in these epidermal systems are, are, are generally sulfide deposits and typically high grade. So it's all about finding the, um, the roots of, of these uh, surface occurrences that we're seeing uh, all over the place at Sandman, for example, and applying that on a broader regional scale, looking at volcanic calderas, essentially, and um, linking, you know, there's a number of keys as geologists, we're looking for alteration, we're looking for geochemistry, we're looking for geophysical signature, and it's a matter of layering all these, um, these ev types of evidence until we get to our dual targets. So I want to talk in a bit more detail about sort of the gold bull story. We've kind of heard sort of how you ended up in Nevada, but you know, why, why now? So why is the time that you've sort of stepped out working for other companies and now you've launched your own, you're the CEO. What is it that sort of, I guess, uh, what, what caused this to happen at this moment? So we, um, my, my project generation team came across a, a couple of very interesting assets that we feel have the potential to significantly increase the resources. Uh, one of those is a salmon asset that we've recently announced, um, which we're acquiring from Newmont. And that particular project we feel has been um, thoroughly explored where there is outcrop and within the first hundred meters or so. However, 80% or so of that asset is actually undercover and that has not been adequately explored in our opinion. And the 20% the or so that is outcropping, it's been well explored in the surface, but we're really interested in the source of that surface gold mineralization that's underneath that. So uh, for us, our exploration program will be two pronged. It'll be looking uh, at the resource uh, expansion potential of the existing resources and at the new discoveries. And, for us, that's super exciting. I mean, we see million ounce potential at an asset like that. It's on the right, it's got the right area code, the right geology, the right structures. Now it's gonna come down to a matter of us dual testing them to, to really prove whether these structures are indeed mineralized or not. And had Sandman previously been drilled by, by Newmont, the previous owner? It had. Um, Newmont did do extensive drilling there, um, predominantly focused on the known resources. Uh, and Newmont um, originally had, had the concept that they could feed that resource into their nearby uh, Twin Creeks operation. Um, for, for whatever corporate reason they've chosen, um, that's not the way to go. That, that particular operation is now in the Nevada a Gold Mines joint venture with Barrick. So this is an asset that falls out of the Nevada Gold Mines um, Barrick joint venture. Uh, it, for us, it's, um, it's a non-core Newmont asset that could be a potential company making asset for us. Uh, for uh, two of my board members, Walt Cole and um, Craig Perry, uh, turned Skeena into a $500 million company using Barrick's non-core assets in BC. 
So mm -hmm. what we really do see an opportunity going for non-core assets of the majors in Nevada and doing something very similar. So that kind of leads me to my next question. Uh, Newmont is notoriously challenging uh, to pick up assets from, uh, but I, I, I don't know, I can't think of a time that they've ever vended anything in Nevada to, to a junior exploration company. Has, has that happened before that you can think of? Not, not to my recollection. Uh, we, we feel very fortunate um, to have seized the Sandman opportunity on um, well, favorable terms. Uh, we, um, we've developed a, a mutually beneficial relationship, we like to think, with Newmont um, over the course of quite some time uh, in appraising the Sandman opportunity and conducting that due diligence. It, it certainly has been a slow process. However, it, they've also been very accommodating. Um, they certainly um, took note of our um, community environmental and, and social governance policies. Uh, for, for a major such as Newmont or any major for that matter, I think who they partner with um, is, is obviously very important from their reputation risk perspective. So they're more important in um, finding a, a good steward for their assets moving forward rather than you know, really focusing on the dollar figure amount. So you're telling me you don't have some sort of blackmail over the VP Corp <laughs> or anything like that? <laughs> no. <laughs> so beyond the assets, you know, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a shareholder of gold bill. I should, I should say that right now. Um, you know, I was, I was first made aware of the project and the company by, by Craig Parry, who's on your, on your board. You know, you've pulled um, some great board members and great investors into this company. You know, let's talk for a second about some of the people who are, are supporting you and your team and how you built those relationships and who you've brought in and, and you know, how you're going to keep that ball rolling and who you're going to, how you're going to continue to, I guess, develop that group of supporters and, uh, and financiers around you. So Craig and I uh, go back quite a while. Uh, we worked together at Rio Tinto Exploration about 15 years ago or so. So ever since then, we've maintained um, contact and we've, we've caught up on a regular basis. And so I think it was at Roundup, 18 months ago that we started discussing the concept of gold ball. And I told him that Sandman um, was becoming available and I heard about some other gold assets in the state that I just thought were such gems of assets that we should really do something together uh, rather than you know, find a home for them and, and vend them on. So Craig and I started establishing the plan and, and the concept of the company uh, way back then. And it's obviously taken some time for, for gold ball to, to come out of Newman and, and into our company. So we're very excited by Google as the first um, first asset, and the, our our backers are extremely supportive. Both Craig and I have a have a range of um, various investors who have been a wonderful wonderful in um, backing our ventures over the years. Uh, Craig in particular has had a, a number of uh, serial successes recently with uh, ISO, Next Gen, This Life, Skinner. And um, I think that just breeds that continual support when, when your investors are, are making money and um, they keep backing your ideas and, and keep backing your team. Um, not only Craig, but we've also got a number of other incredible um, directors on our board that have got really robust um, CVs and reputations. And I think um, combination of having the right assets and the right people has made our, our life easy on the, um, the fundraising side. So we're very grateful for that continued support. Good. Uh, you know, something so you know we first had a, a conversation i think you know about three or four weeks ago uh, i spoke with yourself uh, and i also spoke with i believe two other members of your technical team were on the call and they were both women um and now i used to work uh you know at hatch consulting i'm an engineer i worked with lots of women in in engineering um but I've, I would say there are very few women running junior exploration companies for, for whatever reason. And you've got yourself, obviously, and several others in, in senior roles. Um, I don't know, I'm not actually asking a question here, but you know, you know, that's very unusual. And did you consciously develop a team of, of technically driven women or did that just happen organically through the people you've worked with throughout your career? How did, how did that come about? Yeah, I, I would definitely say that it happened organically. It wasn't deliberate. Um, 
I, I wouldn't say I've built a, a team of women because I've employed the right people for the job. And uh, for example, in Gobal, we do have three female geologists, including myself, and we have three male geologists. So we're, we're not an all girls club. In, in <laughs> fact, <laughs> I've, I've actually been offered roles in the past by women who are striving to form all female boards. And I've actually said no to those roles because I don't agree with gender segregation. And uh, I think diversity and equality are, are, are core personal values of mine. So I think having a, a gender balance of male and females in a board or in a team, in a parliament, is wherever is a really healthy thing. So I'm, I'm all for um, that gender diversity, let's call it. And um, Amy and Stephanie are wonderful geologists who have been um, chosen for their technical ability rather than because of their gender. Yeah, no, good. Um, you know, I, I've often thought about this. Uh, you know, even you see a lot more women uh, that are engineers than geologists even. And that's because my opinion on this is because engineering is very, very often an office job. And so it's mm -hmm. much, much easier to have children and to be home at night. Whereas geology, so many geologists basically give up their entire thirties being off in the field. You know, sometimes yeah. it's convenient in a place like Nevada, but sometimes it's some godforsaken jungle or desert in the middle of, of nowhere. And a lot of people who listen to these podcasts are, are younger people just starting out their career or still students. Do you have any advice for, you know, female technical geologists who, who love that their profession uh, don't necessarily want to get relegated to an office role too early on in their career and sort of balancing the challenges that come with that of, of how, having a balanced life. It certainly is a juggle uh, and I'm, I'm going to be the first to admit that. I've had my, um, my daughter in the field with me more than I care to admit because you know, it's basically you're either apart or, you, or I drag her along. So it, it's a juggle and um, I think most parents, you know, regardless, again, regardless of gender, I think mean, dads don't like missing out on their kids um, growing up either. It's tough. Uh, and Nevada is one of the, the best places to be a geologist for that reason. It's one of the primary reasons I'm actually here. I was gallivanting in the middle of Africa before I had a child and, and now this enables me to spend more time uh, with my daughter and also mm -hmm. maintain my, my geology career. So I think um, it is a juggle and I also think employers um, need to be more flexible with respect to rosters and um, scheduling. Uh, for example, we've got um, a male and a female geologist on part-time because they're juggling their parental commitments on the side. And uh, they're, they're both wonderful geologists and highly productive in the 50% the of the time that they're with Gold Bull. And I think um, ha ha having those leniencies and flexibilities in our industry is required. And um, it's done a lot more in Australia than, than where it is here. It's a bit of an anomaly to have a, you know, a part-time workforce um, over here that's juggling around my, my team's um, parental responsibilities, but I'd rather have the right people in my team and uh, have that accommodation um, to to allow them to have that family time and you know do that juggling balance. As long as uh, we're achieving our goals in Gold Bull and uh, you know we're coming up with the deliverables, we can work around people's unique schedules. And did you say that actually is more common in Australia? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, from you know, from, from my 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 uni mates, for example, have a lot more flexibility than the average um, geologist with the same experience here. Um, I, I'm not sure if that's cultural, but I think it's it, there's a different culture in in mining and you know, in every country. And I mean, Australia working in the mines is like a resort motel experience. You know, you've got gyms, you've got caterers, you've got a lovely lifestyle. It's one week on, one week off. Over here, um, it, it's certainly, a, I think, longer hours and a harder life. And I think, I think there should be um, more of a, a lifestyle balance. You've got, to, you've got to obviously have a life in addition to loving your job and adding value at work. Well, so that's really interesting. And, and I'd heard, I've never worked in Australia, but I've heard that from friends and colleagues that have and sort of heard about the, the luxury of the camps and whatnot mm -hmm. that they have over there. And you know, I guess this is kind of hypothetically speaking, but do you think when you create that environment, you're able to attract a higher caliber of person that's willing to, uh, you know, continually go, go back and forth to the camps, then perhaps, you know, in North America where the camps are a lot rougher and then people are quickly trying to move their way into an office role or, or some other job, 
if they have the skill set or the or the demand to be able to do so. Absolutely. In fact, um, the the first week um, that Goldball was in existence, we got our team together and we we had a a two day culture meeting regarding what we want our company's culture to look like. Because cult culture to us is more important than strategy. You can copy a successful strategy, but you can't copy a successful culture. And in that, uh, we actually identified one of our values as being a company that, that the talent wants to work for. And being able to attract talent um, stems from culture. And we believe that offering that flexibility um, and, and offering um, some of those lifestyle advantages really will attract the best people. And it doesn't have to come at a compromise of, of their deliverables, because if they're the best people, um, the odds are that they're going to be able to deliver um, in a shorter time frame than, than your average person would. So what else came out of that meeting? What, other, um, what are the other key elements of the Gold Bull culture? We're, we're a very passionate team about what we do. And uh, at, at, we, we basically investigated our individual values. And we're not looking for people to have the same values, but by exploring the hierarchy of everyone's values, you can get to um, essentially what makes someone tick. And I think that's very important because then you start tapping into their, their potential genius when people are living in alignment with their hierarchy of values. So we, we all obviously have different values and then it's a matter of linking and aligning our company values to our individual's values and particularly our, our managers and then managers do that with their team, their team does that with their subordinates. So um, we get to know the values of our team before we, we make them employment offers just to make sure we're a cultural fit. We're all aligned. Um, you know, we're all in this to, to add value to our shareholders and also um, to have a good time while we're at it. What kind of values do you personally look for in someone that you're, you're looking to add to your team? If it's, well, let's say um, if someone in a sort of a senior leadership role, whether it's a project geologist or, or what have you. Integrity is a, is a really big one. Uh, integrity, transparency, uh, but being, being able to communicate as well to being able to convey um, to your team uh, what, what, what your needs are, what the company's needs are, and uh, essentially turning those needs into requests to get it done and to basically add value for the company. So the team you have now, did you, did, you, know, did you decide to go after sort of epithermal gold assets in Nevada, then build the team around that? Or had you worked with this team for some time? And then as a group, you sort of looked for the projects or the assets that you guys thought you were best suited to explore and make a discovery and add value in, which, you know, it's a bit of a chicken and egg. Where did you yeah. sort of start with that? I, I always start with a core team, a small core team. Um, for example, our, our geophysicist, Dave Johnson and I have worked together on an offer almost 20 years. And, um, I think that the finding good people is harder than finding good projects. Uh, we, we, um, we make a point of having our core team first, then we find the core asset after we've got the core team, because essentially if you've got a good team, they'll find the good asset. It doesn't, I don't, in my opinion, it doesn't work around the other way as, as easy. And then, um, and then we've, then we've added to that team on the basis that our asset is going to, you know, back up as a fundraising to support the bigger team. So yeah. the bare bones team um, is, is essential in my opinion to find the best asset. Well, you kind of hear it both ways in mining. You know, it's like these, these stupid catchphrases people have. And one of them is, you know, mines are where you find them. And it's, you know, it's wherever you kind of walk up to one. But the other one, which I think is popular in the industry and maybe less well known amongst investors is mines are built, they're not discovered. And, you know, I think this speaks to the fact that the same project in one group of people's hands is pretty much worthless, whilst in perhaps the right team's hand, it can be a extremely valuable asset. And mm -hmm. I guess that kind of lends to your theory there that, you know, if you have the right people, if you built that core team, it's easier to find the project where they can really add value than perhaps the other way around. Mm, yeah, I, I believe that. I think, um, I mean, again, going back to Sam, and that would be one example is of where we think we can bring in our team to extract value out of an asset 
that hasn't become a mine already, but you know what we think we can bring new new ideas and thinking outside the box to uh, an, an area that has been explored previously. So when you were coming up um, as a geologist and you know working around the world and then later in Nevada, are there any um, I guess groups of entrepreneurs or geologists or 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 mine builders or discoverers? that you particularly looked up to or admired when you were sort of starting out your career? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I've been quite fortunate in my various roles, um, you know, especially my first 10 years to have um, had exposure to a number of incredible mentors and people that um, re really took pride in imparting their knowledge and in um, gifting me with um, expensive consultants and gurus in the trade. To, to impart their knowledge. So, um, I mean, that started off from my first job with Lion Ore. Um, Mark Bennett really instilled a, a WMC kind of Western mining um, culture, and that was heavy on training. I mean, I was in, in the field um, you know, with a guru, Nickel, that was probably getting paid the same in a month as I was in a year as a graduate. And there was that generosity of training uh, that I think it's really important in, in growing careers. And then in the, the next company, Rio Tinto, we also had assigned mentors. Uh, I think Craig and I may have had the same geo mentor. Uh, and then the next company at Stripe was also. So I've always been really fortunate in, um, in having a mentor in each company that I work with. And then subsequent to leaving that company, I'd often stay in touch with the previous mentor. They'd become a friend as well as a mentor um, you know, as, your, as my career progressed. Now, is there any advice you would give to sort of younger geologists or people starting out that maybe haven't been able to find that mentor yet or, or would like to find one uh, and are struggling to do it? And, and I, you know, I think of my, my own experience, the companies that I worked with in early on, even the big ones, you know, didn't quite have that program, uh, which sounds like a very good one and a very helpful one in the way that you did at, at Rio. But I was still able to kind of, wiggle my way in places and, and build relationships with people that were that massively helped me along the road. Um, do you have any advice on that or any thoughts on that perhaps? Yeah, I certainly don't think it needs to be like a structured um, graduate program. I think an informal mentorship when, when, when you just have a go-to person that, that is there to provide you that um, advice is really important. And I think um, the, the more networking you can do at any level, um, it really is beneficial because most of our job ends up being about relationships. And the, um, the, the networking can start off as, um, you know, when, when you're at uni doing a geo degree to, it could be industry beers night. Um, I know in Nevada, we have Geological Society of Nevada has um, you know, a monthly get together. And those things are so important to just build those relationships. It could be at that beer night that you meet um, your mentor over the next 20 years. Uh, also, if um, you know, in, in bad times, I went when I was a VAC student at you know, in the late 90s. I volunteered for vacation work, and those um, relationships are, are still strong. And um, so, we're volunteering for VAC work. I don't think we're there right now with the, the current goal price. You won't need a volunteer, but I think just getting um, your foot in the door with companies that you want to work with with um, will work out to your benefit in a decade. Yeah, a decade later, I don't even think I realized how useful that would be at the time. Yeah, well, you know, I can speak to that actually from the other side um, because my analyst at Resource Insider, a guy named Nick, uh, who, our, who our members will be very familiar with now, when he uh, first approached me, he was a student at the Colorado School of Mines doing a master's degree. And he said, you know, I've been following what you guys are doing. I'd like to work for you or right, part time. And we just started about a month before. And I said, you know, we, we're just starting. We're not making any money yet. Like, we can't hire you. And he said, I'll work for free. And I said, well, you know, I can afford that, I guess. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I always felt kind of guilty having someone work for me for free. But he just kept asking for more work and more work and more work. And then a few months later came along and it was his, uh, you know, summer break. And he asked we would hire him as an internship and he'd done such a good job. I felt so guilty that I, I basically had to hire him. <laughs> I had to start paying him. Uh, and, you know, he's been with us ever since and it's been almost three years now. And he's, you know, now it's, he's got a, he's done a great job and he's an integral part of the operation. Uh, that's a, that's a wonderful example. Yeah. 
and it's you know it made it's made all the difference for our relationship i think for his career and certainly for the quality of, of what we do at resource insider so you know i can i can personally attest that um while i don't expect people to work for free as a gesture it, it definitely goes a long long way and you know on the other side early on in my career i worked for a junior company that had fallen on hard times and i volunteered to sort of take a pay cut because i well honestly i saw I was probably either going to get a pay cut or get fired altogether if I didn't volunteer, but, <laughs> but I did do it. And uh, I kept the job and it turned into something great. And, uh, you know, I know that went a long way with the management. So, you know, it, it, I think it is so important to, to show people your loyalty to the company and the project and the team. And, you know, I've, I've certainly seen it from both sides. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is there anything that you particularly try to do in terms of the, the younger people you're working with, whether they're, uh, you know, geologists or, or anyone starting your company to try to help mentor them and bring them up through the ranks within the industry? Yeah, certainly. I, I sit down with them all on a, a, a biannual type basis and uh, we, we go through uh, like a SWOT analysis. We go through our strengths and weaknesses and it's reciprocal. We, we do it on each other. And um, we, we also, um, again, come back to Valleys and discuss goals. Um, we do goal setting and where they want to end up, what they want to learn, where they want to be in a few years' time. And uh, we, we try and work around uh, what, what really floats their boat um, because people just do a better job when they're loving what they're doing. And I've got mm. some geologists love data and number crunching and resource modeling. Others just want to be in the field and hate being in front of a computer. So we just like marry up everyone's strengths and weaknesses. Of course, you're going to have to do some things that you don't always want to do, but we try and limit that so that people are really passionate about what they're doing. They're doing a great job um, at, what, at what their their tasks are, and it just results in more discoveries and, and happier teams. So, you know, you've recently, um, correct me if I've got this wrong or I missed something along the road, but, you know, I, I've seen you now you're a CEO of a company, you're in a much more capital markets facing role than you've previously had. Am, am I right on that? Uh, no, so I've previously been CEO of listed companies, Australian listed companies. Uh, oh took, man, I should know that by now, I'm sorry. So what, let's talk about that. What were the Australian listed companies you were previously a part of? So I, um, I found in 2012, I founded Metals of Africa on the ASX and okay. um, that went um, battery minerals due to a slump in the zinc price in 2013 uh, and um, th that was focused on African exploration discovered a, a massive graphite deposit in Mozambique and then uh, took, took a break from the CEO, CEO role which is largely family um, orientated uh, mm -hmm. with my little one and during that time I established uh, NV Resources which is a project generation um, house that was essentially linking or matchmaking uh, companies looking for assets um, we, our team, our team of mine finders would go find them assets and a whole range of companies from the big ones to um, shelves. Really? So that it was almost like a project generation shop in some ways. And so how, did companies pay you to do that or did you find them and you got a cut of the deal or some combination of the two? And We, we worked on success-based mandates. So if we didn't find them in the asset, we didn't get paid anything. And uh, our typical model was... Uh, it's a model I learned from a, from a great geologist called Hart, and it's uh, an expenditure fee model. So essentially, we'd find them the asset, and then we, my team gets a 3% expenditure fee of that asset. So, it, it, and then that, that fee turns into a 3% royalty. Doesn't sound much. So for example, you know, if you spend a million dollars exploring an asset, we get 30 grand. But we're not in this to make 30 grand. But if you, um, if you develop the asset and you spend $200 million on it, we get $6 million and then that goes into a royalty. So essentially we make big bucks on assets that are developed and we mm -hmm. feel that's fair because if it's not developed, we shouldn't be getting millions of dollars worth of paper, which is you know, the typical Canadian Aussie uh, model. Uh, and it, it went really well, especially in, um, in, in a difficult market, which you know, has been for a few years. This was like, it's perceived as win-win. So we've got a number of these assets that are already under contract and we're receiving the drips and drabs of the, um, the expenditure fee, but it really will pay off when, they, when these things start becoming mines. If yeah. they start. 
but even the small, uh, I guess, expenditure fees was able to sort of keep the wheels on the operation and pay your team and, and keep everything moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was, um, it's a great model. And, and there's typically reimbursement, of course, at front. And um, some of them we have annual fees in addition to the expenditure fees. So uh, it, it worked. Um, I feel like it was a real win-win kind of deal structure. And it's, Yeah, um, I've not heard of that before. It's really interesting. So before I got all that wrong about your past roles, what I was going to ask you um, is, you know, how did you make the transition? And because I know I get asked about this a lot um, by younger people in the industry, because it's similar to what I did. But how did you make the transition from technical person to uh, capital markets, business focused uh, combination role? Because uh, I think, you know, there are many, many people who like the idea of one day being a CEO or vice president of Corp Dev and being involved in all the deal making and all the, you know, the sort of sexier side of the industry, so to speak, but don't really see a path between one or the other. Is there, how did you find that? And is there any advice you'd have for people who, who are looking at that? Yeah, I, there's advice I'd have for both. Um, the management and the juniors, because what, what I felt was incredibly useful as a, as a project geo type level, junior geo, was that the board of these companies would invite the younger geos often to, to basically be a, a fly on the wall and to be in the room during a board meeting. And for the most of the time, we, we were just mute and listening, but it really exposed um, me to a whole, you know, the whole corporate element, the ins and outs mm -hmm. of the, the corporate side. And uh, it was essentially just the best learning um, that I could have achieved was just taking a backseat in, in, um, in aspects of board meetings, not even board meetings, just technical executive management meetings. In many companies, they, um, they're exclusive, just the executive management. You know, you'd have a, a handful of people and no one else in the room. It's all confidential. However, um, a couple of the companies I worked for considered that all useful information um, for everyone to know, like the strategy, like where we're headed. They didn't expect input from the younger, um, you know, the younger geos in the room. That we were just literally on the sidelines. But I think um, that was very useful in in that training and, and getting that exposure to the corporate, the legal, the governance, um, your comp company secretarial aspects that you wouldn't normally um, get exposure to as a field geologist. So I, I'd say that probably that was probably the start, and just you know that really started the um, the cogs turning, and and my interest in the corporate side just grew and grew. And then um, I guess my, my first break was during the, um, the boom times. Um, I'd, I'd found a, a coal disc deposit in Indonesia working for Shark Resources. And then a company, an Indian company, looked at buying the asset. And they, um, they went through all our books and accounts and they'd worked out that, you know, we'd spent something like $3 million drilling this thing that was now worth $40 million. And um, just couldn't believe that it, you could go from 3 mil to 40 mil in a drill program mm -hmm. and so that um the founder of that indian company called Ad advaita um kieran offered me a job where i'd be working for equity on the money i made so that was obviously a, a lucky break in a lucrative position that i could um it, if i added that kind of value i could get 10 percent for just doing my job type thing um so i then um enjoyed working with kieran and looking for coal all over the world um, and then after that was when i founded Metals of Africa. And was that the first time you started to, I guess, get ownership positions, small or otherwise, in companies? Previous to that, I, um, I had exposure to employee options uh, in mm -hmm. com the companies I work for, most of the companies I work for. And that's something that I, um, I feel quite passionately about too. So all, all of our team, whether it's a field assistant to um, Project Geo to Exploration Manager, they all have options in our company. Uh, having that ownership, I think um, it, it creates a different mindset. You know, we're we're yeah. all line shareholders and we're, we're not paid the highest salaries, but if we find a gold mine, we're all going to make a lot of money and so are our shareholders. Uh, if we don't if we don't find a gold mine, then we shouldn't be making a lot of money. So um, I, I think options and, and everyone having a sense of skin in the game is really important. It's another thing that's not done as much in the USA as it is in Australia. I'm not sure about what it, what, what it's like up there. I've got a lot of ASX experience and relatively new to TSX. Um, so yeah. I, um, 
I, well, I, I think it I think it really there. depends on the company. You know, there's some companies that reward people all the way through the ranks and there's some that very, very, very few people make any money on them, <laughs> including the shareholders on a lot of uh, TSX listed companies. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I would say, I guess for me, that the point where I really started learning about it was buying and losing money from stocks. And there's probably nothing that uh, makes you pay attention and, and, uh, kind of eager to learn that side of the business more than actually losing money and not wanting to do it again. Mm -hmm. Certainly my experience. So let's talk for a second about sort of responding to and managing setbacks and problems that occur through exploration. You know, you've spent your career in exploration it's basically an industry that's designed to fail, you know, less than sort of 1% of, you know, programs ever become anything meaningful. As a geologist and now as a CEO, you know, how do you manage that risk and manage failure and whilst not, I guess not, uh, I, I would say, um, allowing the company or yourself to suffer a catastrophic blow? How do you, how do you do that in such a, sort of a challenging industry where success is so rare? I think uh, it comes down to doing what you say you're going to do with the money. Um, so most of our investors are sophisticated investors. They, they realize this is a, a high risk, high reward sector. If you had one roll of the dice, you probably wouldn't be in resources. You, you, mm -hmm. you got to keep backing the same, the same successful team. And eventually one of those roles is, is going to come out positive. So I think if we, say, if we do what we say we're going to do with the money, there's obviously no guarantee, but I, I think that, that builds an element of trust and transparency. Uh, you know, we, we say we're going to do X, Y, and Z, we do that. And then if we don't have um, positive results, we don't sugarcoat it. We'll come back and tell our investors, whether it's via the market or in person, um, yeah, we, we, had a, we had a chance and we blew it, so it's on to the next. And we don't keep trying to flog a, a dead horse. Uh, we, we move on. Uh, we don't get romantically attached to our projects. Um, it's, as a geologist, uh, I used to get passionate about my projects and I just one more drill hole. But now, you know, as, as a CEO that's more corporate, um, if, if we don't find it within an allocated budget, we move on and we keep going until, uh, we, you know, we'll answer a winner. Okay. Um, you know, before we say goodbye, you know, we're coming up on an hour now. Uh, I think what can people... You know, let me start again. There are a lot of different exploration companies in Nevada. Uh, a lot of people looking for gold there. What is it that makes Gold Bull stand out from its competitors? You know, every investor has a finite amount of capital. Um, there's only so much exposure they can get. Mm -hmm. Why Gold Bull as opposed to any of the other number of juniors who claim they're going to be finding the next Nevada in gold mine? We've got a, a two-fold growth strategy. We're looking for A, acquisitions, and B, exploration success. So I think we've proven that we, we've done our first uh, acquisition of a, of a 300,000 ounce resource um, with Sandman. And um, that's the first of what we hope will be other acquisitions also of existing resources. So our team is currently appraising a number of assets uh, that have ounces in the ground that we feel we can get on real favorable terms. If we can acquire ounces cheaper than we, than we can drill them, then we're going to acquire them because there's lower risk for our shareholders. Uh, alternatively, or in, a, in parallel, we will be exploring. Uh, we've got a team of mine finders, and I'm confident, I'm backing Lindsay Crave and Dave Johnson as my technical experts, that they're going to come up with more ounces via exploration. So we, we've got this, this twofold. I think most explorers are, are looking just at exploration. I'm spending more of my time on the acquisition front and my technical team have got the exploration part covered. Um, we're also locally based, uh, where, where, where the action is, we're not flying in from you know, another part of the world to, to be um, on the ground. All of our projects are a couple of hours from where our team lives. And um, I, I believe that we're going to put our money where our mouth is. Um, Craig and I always invest on the same terms as our shareholders during the placements. Uh, I'll be putting my money as will Craig uh, and many of our other team members and directors. So we're, we're all aligned and we're all in this uh, for the same reasons to, to add value and make a positive difference along the way. 
Now, now people might be critical of the acquisition strategy saying, well, at least until today, we were in a bull market. Um, you know, it's been a bit of a harder day today, but, you know, as, as metal prices go up, as there's more interest in the space, it's harder to get good value at, from an acquisition. Acquisitions get more and more expensive. Perhaps discovery and exploration gets cheaper. Do you still think there's room to be competitive there? Is, are there still deals to be had on the acquisition front or, or has that all been priced in now? Are these things going at crazy valuations? I, I do think there is um, an opportunity there and I think it comes down to sensible and, and opportunistic structuring, being creative with the structuring, um, you know, potentially stage milestones of payments and so forth, along with success that coincides with the company's success. So I certainly do think that there's um, room for additional acquisitions if they're structured correctly. The structuring is imperative. You know, we're not going to go pay $50 million for something to blow our own capital structure out. Um, so it all comes down to doing the right deal um, for our shareholders, of which we're you know, fully aligned with our shareholders and um, adding value in, in parallel by, by both streams. And um, it, it's, a, it's a space to watch the market, seeing what we've done with Sandman. Um, pretty sure the next deal won't be the same as Sandman. It's going to be a, a hybrid and you know, no, no deal is the same. So just watch that space for, for next year. There will be more um, exploration um, with, a, with a, in particularly a focus on Sandman. I'm certainly striving for additional acquisition or two. So Shri, I have a weird question to ask before we go. And I, I try to ask people this, but you know, is there anything that you and your team uh, believe wholeheartedly a theory you have a concept you have that other people think are crazy that you you get pushback from competitors or from colleagues do you guys have anything you're sort of you're working on that other people might think is a bit nuts i've got uh, personally I'm, I'm i do something that they <laughs> think's nuts i i think i could find metal in the ground using divining rods don't worry, we won't be spending our shareholders' money on those dual targets. But like my geo team would think I'm nuts. But that's a that's something a little crazy and embarrassing about myself. Uh, to technically wise, we're relying on robust science. Uh, we you know we're all scientists, and we've got a systematic approach um, to what we're doing, the business we're conducting. So we're certainly relying a lot on geophysics. However, I wouldn't say we've got a black box with respect to inventing a new IP or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And we're going to apply known science. Uh, science has become highly advanced and evolved over the, even the last decade. You know, 3D IP now isn't like a 3D IP it was 10 years ago. So we're relying on the experts in the fields and we're harnessing on, on that technology. All right. Well, Shuri, thank you so much for sitting down and going through this with us today. I'm very excited about what comes next. I'm a shareholder gold bull. I'm very impressed by everything that's been done to date and even more so after this conversation. So if people want to learn more about you, your team, what you guys are doing at Gold Bull, where can they find out? Go to our website as a first start, www.goldbull.ca. And uh, via the website, you can reach out to myself or our team. Um, there's a link and you can leave a message and we'll get it. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jamie.